into our message today in Isaiah chapter 9, because if we're honest today, we know God's word says and declares that all is well, but at the end of the day, does it really feel like it, you know? In light of everything that we're experiencing, in light of all that we've experienced in the past, is all really well? Um, I remember last week after the welcome, I asked all of you to greet each other and, and tell each other your favorite song. And, uh, and Laura asked me what my favorite Christmas song was, and I not really thought about it. And uh, all of a sudden I said, I think the name of it's The Spirit of Christmas by Ray Charles. And uh, do y'all remember that song? Okay, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> if you've seen... Uh, the, uh, the the Christmas vacation show. Do y'all remember that? You watch that every Christmas? Some of you. I don't. I'm a pastor. I don't watch that. But there's a show called uh, Christmas Vacation. Chevy Chase, uh, also known as Clark Griswold, gets stuck in the attic. And uh, while he gets stuck in the attic, he finds these, you know, old uh, gloves, pink gloves. And, and, he, and he finds this old reel, this video reel from 1959. And then he starts watching the reel and the story unfold. When he was a child, all of those emotions are suddenly conjured up in Clark's heart. And you can see a, a, a little tear. And he just, you know, just goes back to 1959. And when you watch the show, all the nostalgia comes back. All the love of Christmas starts to swell in your heart all the joy all is well right that that's the feeling we talk about love and and faith and peace we, we talk about christmas being this this festive holiday but at the end of the day what if you don't experience christmas like you know you're supposed to experience you know what i'm talking about you know i i mean joy love and, and, and you're living more in the past than the present and when you kind of grow older you realize that every season christmas starts to change in stages from when you were a child to when you were a college student and now you're a parent and now you're a grandparent and we think of the things of the past, and we wish they were the things of the present. And if we're real honest, when we look across the dinner table at Christmas, we see the empty chair, and we live in a sense of gloom. So what do we do when love turns to loneliness on Christmas? What, what, what do we do when anticipation turns to anguish? maybe even anger. What, what do we do when, when glory is exchanged from gloom? So I want to talk to you today a, a brief message um, entitled From Gloom to Glory. From Gloom to Glory. And, and in Isaiah 9, we've been looking at these ancient prophecies that foretell the birth of Jesus. And we see here in in Isaiah 9, the Israel, they are in darkness. They are in destruction. In fact, on 26 different occasions, the city of Megiddo in Galilee was destroyed by war. Gloom, anguish is looming over the people of God. All right? I mean, it, it's looming. And Isaiah needed a hope. So he gives us a hope. Isaiah chapter 9, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four encouragements about our gloom this Christmas. Four encouragements about our gloom. It's going to be the fastest four-point sermon ever. So if you're taking notes, you just get ready, write them down. Number one, here we go. A gloom is passing. A gloom is passing. Now look at Isaiah chapter 9. We'll start in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more what? Gloom. No more gloom for those who were in distress. 
Now this gloom, we could talk about the gloom for a while, but the gloom started back in Genesis chapter 3. Sin entered the world. Gloom was reality in the garden. All right? But Isaiah says, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, this is so good, he will honor Galilee of the nations. It's you and me. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. So while we were experiencing the gloom that we created for ourselves in the garden, all right, Isaiah is saying, listen, your gloom is not final. Gloom does not have the final word. God has the final word. That's good news, church, that we are living in gloom. But on the other side of gloom, there is glory. And the only way that glory is possible was because of Jesus, who we celebrate this Christmas. This is what Isaiah is talking about. He's saying, now look, you're experiencing gloom. But, but Israel, as you are experiencing your own gloom that you have created in the garden, even in the midst of your gloom, you can see God's goodness. You can see his goodness. All right? So that's number one. A gloom is passing, number one. Number two, a glow is present. A glow is present. Look at verse two. The people walking in darkness have what? Seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now listen, this light is not manufactured by human hands. This light is not concocted by the sun. This light is emanating from a creator who spoke and the world existed. This light is a different type of light. When scripture talks about light, what, what we know is that that light is always equated with the presence of God. Every time. Light is equated with the presence of God. In fact, you know this. The psalmist says that the word is what? A light. A light to my path. That's what the light is. And Jesus said it this way. I am the light of the world. And he goes on to say to the church, you are the light of the world and that we walk as children in the light and so it was the light even in in the christmas story it was the light emanating from the star that led the wise men to jesus now church listen we may be living in gloom today but we see the light of glory over the horizon we're walking in darkness there's pain, there's hurt, there's suffering. But just over the horizon, there's a light that we can anticipate that will show the world, expose the darkness, and show the world the light of salvation in Christ. This is the light that we're here to say is worthy of our attention, our affection, and all that we are. Jesus is coming to get his bride and his splendor and glory. Number one, a gloom is passing. Number two, a glow is present. And number three, a gladness is perceived. Gladness is perceived. Look at verse three. You have enlarged the nation and increased their what? Their joy. You've increased their joy. Even in the midst of gloom, you have increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. So joy is going to be the result of God's revelation of himself through Messiah. This is the joy that is all satisfying. This 
gloom that you're feeling today, Israel, this gloom is here today, but glory is what you will experience tomorrow in a manger. In a manger, right? Joy is in Jesus. Verse 4 says, For is in the day of Midian's defeat your enemies, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. The bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. And that will be fuel for the fire. Now, if you're here on Wednesday, you understand how to interpret these verses. Because these verses are the foundation of what we looked at in Isaiah 11. The root of Jesse, the lion and the lamb. The lion will lay down with the lamb. There will be a monarch that's going to be different from any king who's going to be the prince of peace. And he's going to make peace happen in places where peace was almost impossible. This is what the prophecy says. This monarch will be paradoxical for all people. This monarch will plunge all nations to their knees and surrender. This monarch will create unity, peace, and joy. Well, how in the world is that going to happen, right? Well, he, he gives us exactly how this is going to happen. So you, you have a gladness perceived. That's number three. And number four, a glory is provided. What kind of glory? This is, this is the big part. All right, you ready? Isaiah here provides the solution that we celebrate this Christmas. Here's the solution. Ready? Notice the word for in verse 6. The word for. That is a conjunction that connects all of these clauses that we just read for the climactic part of the story. And you've heard this verse before. Verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Now, this child, listen, the child is born. He's the Mighty God. Don't miss that. The prophecy Isaiah is saying, is this child will be the mighty God. The Hebrew word El Gabor is used in Scripture. It always refers to the one, the only creator, almighty God. This is going to be a child, the one who saves this mighty God. He continues, and he says, oh, and he's also going to be the everlasting father, the prince of peace now you know this if you're a parent if you have children these are not normal nicknames that you would give your child right i mean nobody has ever said you know that three-year-old baxter that you have he is he's a wonderful counselor no he needs some wonderful counseling but he's not he's not a wonderful counselor right and, and, and nobody's accused satch of being the everlasting father right nobody's ever Nobody's ever called him. These titles that Isaiah provides, they are explicitly divine titles, all right? They're divine. And only Jesus could fulfill these titles. So what, what's, what's Isaiah saying? What's Scripture saying? Church, listen. God's solution for our gloom on Christmas is not education. If we needed education, he would have sent a teacher. I, God's solution for our gloom it is, not, it is not political. If it was political, God would have sent a politician. God's solution for our gloom this Christmas, it, it, it's, it's not militaristic. If it were militaristic, he would have sent a strong monarch who was more like a general than a Jesus? What was our problem? Our problem 
was Genesis 3. Our problem is that we needed forgiveness. And our problem could only be solved in the person of Jesus. So what did God do? God became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus. God became incarnational in Christ. It goes on to say in verse 7, of the greatness of whose go- his government. This government, this monarch, he will, he will be so strong that every monarch will bow the knee to this monarch. And he's going to be a child. And peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne. Going back to last Wednesday, the root of Jesse. Be a real person. From David's reign. Over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Look, this, this, is, this is not a human king. This is a divine king. This is the everlasting father. This is the mighty God born as a child. So, can I be real honest? This Christmas, you, you'll probably feel some gloom. Because we're living and some tension we're we're living in the already but not yet jesus is here but he has not returned and so we live in some gloom we have enemies we have oppressors over every shoulder we we celebrate sin and denigrate our savior we we have wars and rumors of wars we have sickness left and right and front triple demic Cancer, the list goes on. It's gloomy. But Isaiah is saying, you know what? There's hope in the midst of gloom. His name is Jesus. He's a person. He's not a monarch like like you think he's supposed to be. He is born this day a child, a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, and that's all we need to go from gloom to glory.